Let, let me stop you there. And because there's many other topics to get to, but I want to get Scott in here and do You've just heard Mark lay out what his uh, assessment of the first week and where we are now. And we're going to talk about what could come next. But Scott, do you um, want to know how you feel about what Mark said? You have a similar analysis. What have you seen over the first week and where we're at now? I'm actually far more um, supportive of the Russian narrative. Um, I don't give the Ukrainian narrative uh, any uh, any weight. Uh, this we're witnessing a CIA MI6 run information operation. Um, the Ukrainian government is totally uh, the, the information coming out of the Ukrainian government is totally controlled by this operation. We have CIA uh, operatives bragging about this on. Uh, on social media, uh, you know, recently retired uh, covert operatives who say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm speaking, we're doing this. Uh, they want us to come back. Now you have to take that with a grain of salt, but um, no, <laughs> I, I've done this before. I've, I've participated in information operations and I've watched them um, unfold. I know how this is done intimately and I know what I'm seeing. Um, I'm seeing a very sophisticated information operation that uh, has two purposes. First of all, no one in a position of responsibility thinks Ukraine is going to win this war. No one in a position of responsibility thinks Ukraine is winning this war. Uh, and no one in a position of responsibility thinks that NATO is going to intervene on the side of Ukraine. Um, there's there's two, uh, two uh, objectives here. One objective is targeting um, the Russian domestic audience. Uh, there, if anything's come out of this, and and, and I'll tell you, the, the the somebody who's been interesting to watch unravel during this entire um, conflict is uh, Michael McFall. Um, <laughs> he, he's really become a symbol of um, pathos. Uh, he's he's a pathetic individual, uh, but. And, and through trying to explain why he's not the bad guy, he's all but admitted that the policy of the United States has been for some time regime change in Russia. Now, we all knew that. We all knew they wanted to get Putin out and all this. Um, yeah, I mean, anybody who saw what the reset was, the reset was an embrace of Dmitry Medvedev in the hopes that Russia would see that by supporting Medvedev over Putin, that they could have better relations with the West. Um, well, Russia wasn't playing that game, um, but it's 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 more than this. They, they talk about democratization. We McFall has all but admitted that the entire pro-democracy movement funded by the West uh, had as its purpose regime change. And so these regime change uh, people and, 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 and remember, it's a program run by the CIA. It's run by uh, the political action covert branch of, uh, of the CIA. Um, <laughs> they do this all the time. They're not just propaganda. They are actively conspiring to uh, to remove the Russian leader. And what they're trying to do right now is to create a narrative of defeat in Russia, of hopelessness in Russia. And a large part of the sanctions game that we're seeing right now is bluff. Bluff. Go in strong. Talk about the pain. Target the oligarchs. Tell the oligarchs you have no choice but to take down Putin. Tell the mothers you have no choice but to go in the street. You are, it's hopeless for you. It's hopeless for you. It's hopeless for you. Um, and some people are, are a little bit perturbed, myself included, but you know that's just because I'm a data-driven guy and I don't like to examine situations where there's a complete data set over here and an incomplete data set over here of the silence of the Russian government. But I think the Russian government, is, you know, their silence is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. They don't care. They don't want to engage in a propaganda war. They're letting reality unfold on the ground in Ukraine as we speak. This is one of the most decisive military victories in modern history. Uh, there was a Russian general gave an interview uh, yesterday uh, who said, when the book is written on this, people are going to be studying this for decades to come as you know, how to do an operation like this. This is how it's supposed to be done. He said something interesting that goes along with what Mark said. He said, we are applying the tactics of Syria. Now, in the West, you go, oh, my God, that means you're surrounding Aleppo and destroying it. No, the tactics of Syria are to go in, surround, and talk. Look how, look how they drove 
the, 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 the jihadists out of, out of Syria into Idlib by surrounding, by talking, by getting them to go on buses and leaving. That's how they won the war. They didn't destroy everything. I mean, the, the truth is obvious to all who study the truth, but the propagandists are out there. So one thing is this regime change dream that they have for Russia. Um, and again, because the narrative being pushed here in the West talks about how badly the Russian people are suffering, they are, um, and you know how the oligarchs are being targeted, they are, um, how the ruble is collapsing, it is, how the Moscow stock market is paralyzed, of course it is, uh, and therefore they draw the conclusion that Putin is vulnerable and he will be overthrown. He isn't and he won't be. Uh, that's just the, the statement of fact. Um, the second thing, and this is the far more dangerous thing, well, let me go back to the Putin thing. To show you the extremes here, Lindsey Graham is a U.S. senator who is well read into the strategic objectives of the United States. And you can tell that the man is extraordinarily frustrated because he knows the truth, that our policy is failing, that Putin is actually becoming stronger. Didn't they learn about Saddam? Saddam Hussein in 1991 at the end of the Gulf War was at his most vulnerable. I mean, the man was on the verge of taking the 75 cent solution in the back of the head. And that's the cost of a nine millimeter bullet that one of his generals was going to put because he had failed across the board. What kept Saddam alive were sanctions. Saddam Hussein was able to take the pain of the Iraqi people and instead of having it absorbed by him, turn it around on those who were issuing it. And Russia is going to do the same thing. You know, there is an intellectual cat class in Moscow and, and St. Petersburg who are going to cry. They always cry. You know, the pro-Western liberals. Oh, my God, we're suffering. Oh, my God, it's Putin. There's the rest of Russia, the real people. And uh, they, they aren't putting up with this nonsense. They're not crying. Uh, they're, they're, they're tightening their belts. To them, this is their version of the great patriotic war. Uh, they will step up. They will do what's necessary to ensure that Russia uh, emerges victorious. That's the majority of Russia. That's the majority of Moscow. But the West only gives an echo chamber to the little wimpy liberal elites who cry in their tea. And I don't mean to be too mean, but, you know, we're talking about people dying right now. So I really don't have too much sympathy for uh, the feelings of um, these milk toast individuals. Now we go to um, the most dangerous aspect. Oh, well, Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham, last night, tweeted, where's our von Stauffenberg? Where's, where's, uh, he, he mentioned somebody else, you know, but Brutus. basically he was saying, saying you have to assassinate Putin. A sitting U.S. senator on the Armed Services Committee is asking for someone to assassinate Putin. I mean, that is, A, despicable. Uh, B, it's a sign of desperation because Lindsey Graham is reading the real intelligence and he knows what's really going on. And he understands how badly we're being beaten as we are being, and I don't want to use bad language, but it's, there's a term that begins with a B and you slap somebody. Uh, that's what's happening to us right now in the West. We are being B slapped uh, by the Russians. And, you know, to their credit, they're not dancing in the streets, uh, but they're, they're winning this thing across the board. But the most dangerous thing about this propaganda is what's going on. You saw it last night. When the Russians moved in on the um, on the nuclear power plant to take it over, and there was every reason in the world to do this, you had these neo-Nazi fanatics right now who know they've been beat, and all you have to do is go into the spent fuel uh, 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 pool and pull out a couple of those um, highly radioactive fuel rods, grind them up, mix them up in a barrel full of explosives, and you got a dirty bomb, and. Um, you know, when, when, when extremists tend to go down, they try to go down taking as many people with them. And the Russians are very concerned about some sort of uh, uh, nuclear terrorism on the part of these people. So you take over the nuclear plant to prevent this from happening. Uh, you also want to investigate whether or not the Ukrainian government in cahoots with others had been seeking to uh, put in place some sort of plutonium extraction. Zelensky spoke into the Munich conference about nuclear weapons. Maybe we'll withdraw from the MPT. Maybe we'll pursue nuclear weapons. If you're Russia, you can't take that sitting down. So see, look, the United States would have seized this nuclear power plant on day one. I mean, it's just a normal military objective. Plus you control 25% of the electricity generation capacity of Ukraine. So, but this, this normal military operation took place. 
in which the Ukrainians resisted and in a, in a firefight, an administrative training building was caught on fire. The entire world went crazy. CNN, all the major media networks, prompted by Zelensky and the CIA operation, saying that this is going to be five times worse than Chernobyl and we have to have a no-fly zone imposed. This is Zelensky's last hope, a no-fly zone, something where NATO comes in with aircraft and creates a, um, a safe zone for the operation of his government and the restoration of, of, of rule. NATO wisely has resisted this because they understand what the reality is. But as we speak, NATO has already invoked Chapter 4. Poland and the Baltic states have made Ukraine a Chapter 4 issue, which means there's constant discussion about how Ukraine impacts the national security of these four nations and what NATO can do to assist them. As this humanitarian crisis increases, and it will, they're already overwhelmed with refugees. They're going to be even more overwhelmed with refugees. It will become a humanitarian disaster. They'll be screaming for a humanitarian buffer zone in Western Ukraine. And as the Zelensky government flees Kiev, as they will, as most of them already have, and try to set themselves up in Lvov, which is the, the, the heart of the cancer of this Bandera movement, there can be no denazification of Ukraine without the Russians purging Lvov. And this general who talked about this thing, he said, understand, we, we don't stop until we get to the western border of Ukraine. There is no Russia saying we took Kiev and it's victory. Victory is only achieved when there is denazification, and denazification can only occur when Lvov has fallen and Russian troops control the western border of, of Ukraine. As this occurs, there's going to be more and more pressure brought to bear for some sort of NATO EU intervention in Western Ukraine. And um, this is where the propaganda becomes dangerous because democracies are not controlled, but motivated by their constituencies. And if through this propaganda, the constituencies rise up and demand action of politicians who will lose their position should they choose not to act, you may see some sort of um, insanity ensue. And uh, what I'm hoping is that the Russians don't overreact, that the Russians recognize that this is going to happen and that they just simply extend the, excuse me, bitch slapping that's been going on to whoever tries to come into Western U Ukraine and uh, crush them like the bugs they are. But it's a very dangerous thing. If the West thinks that it can go into Western Ukraine. And that's the danger of this propaganda operation because it is designed to create an Article 4 um, generating a scenario that gets NATO in Western Ukraine to, to preserve uh, some sort of aspect of Ukrainian autonomy. Well, Scott, and you, uh, um, there's this information war going on. It's very hard to determine who's telling the truth and who isn't. How are you able to do that? From How are you coming to your analysis based on what kinds of information? Well, I mean, for instance, I come to my analysis about information operations run by the CIA by the fact that I have intimate knowledge of what an information operation looks like. No, I don't mean that. I mean what's going on on the ground right now. Okay, well, on the ground, um, you know, we have a dearth of uh, information. Let's just be honest about that. Uh, what, yeah. we, what we get is, um, you know, overwhelmingly from Ukrainian sources, et cetera. However, you, you, you know, as a military professional, you know, you, you study military history. And let's, let's start with uh, certain things. When armies, and, and the Ukrainian army was a very large, very well-equipped, and very well-trained, and, and well-led uh, Western-style military. Let's not, and, and we're talking about a military of over 200,000 with another 200, 300,000 uh, people in, in potential reserve, not a small military. Um, it's engaged a very professional Russian military uh, that had deployed around 200,000 troops along the border, not all of whom, uh, actually a small percentage of whom were, were committed to actual combat operations. When you look at casualty rates in World War II, when the, you know, at Normandy, you know, uh, the, 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 the casualty ratio is around 1 to 1 1.2, 1 to 1 1.4. Even on the Eastern Front, where the Russians were fighting these giant battles of annihilation, 
the casualty ratios are one to 1.4, one to 1.8, one to two, meaning for every dead Russian and a big victory, you have 1.8 dead Germans. Um, the casualty ratio right now is one to six. For every dead Russian, there's six dead Ukrainians. This is a rout. This isn't even close. This is annihilation. And um, it's hard to come by those kind of figures, though, isn't it? By how many dead really, they really uh, are on the Ukrainian side or on the Russian side. Russians say 458 or 98 or something. 498. Yeah. I have no reason to doubt the Russian figure. Ukrainians say they've got 3,500 Russians dead. But Really? Where are the bodies? Yeah. Um, you, you agree with that, that the, the Russians have told the Ukrainians in those two meetings, uh, have warned them what could happen. And uh, I think. I take the Russians at, at face value. Um, let, let's, let's put it this way. My assessment of Russia and its government, to include its president, because I'm not somebody who believes that the nation of Russia is encapsulated into a single individual. I'm somebody who has studied how Russian policymaking is done, that it's literally from the ground up and a very well-coordinated thing. Um, unlike the move into, into Crimea in 2014, which was very spontaneous and lacked the kind of uh, detailed planning which caused the Russian government to have to make um, modifications to its plan that were economically uh, painful to, to absorb Crimea. Everything about what's going on right now has been planned. Now, we all know that um, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. So I'm not saying that the Russian plan is uh, you know, the, the gold standard and everything's working fine. But what I'm saying is the, the Russians entered this with an objective. And the objective was not a negotiated solution with the Ukrainian government. You cannot have denazification. You cannot have demilitarization with the Zelensky government still in power. The Zelensky government is the personification of pro-Bandera movement. They've allowed the Banderites to infiltrate every aspect of their government. And the military under Zelensky has become a de facto proxy of NATO. And when we say demilitarization, what they mean is the deconstruction of every aspect of NATO infrastructure inside Ukraine. Um, and then the third uh, condition, which Russia's made, is neutrality. Uh, the, the neutrality of, uh, of, of Ukraine, which I would say is um, up for uh, discussion, not in terms of letting them be pro-NATO, but I think Russia might be inclined, instead of having a neutral Ukraine after all of this, they have a pro-Russia Ukraine. So um, neutrality might be off the table now, because I, I think Russia at this point in time, especially at this stage in confrontation with the West, would prefer a Ukraine to look more like Belarus than a, a Ukraine that looked like Finland. Um, so there, there is no negotiation. What they're trying to do is give the Zelensky government a graceful exit off stage. Um, rather than come in and do the painful thing, which is forcibly uh, extricate, eliminate, annihilate, liquidate, whatever term you want to use, that's going to happen to Zelensky, uh, to, to show him the exit door and say, please leave. Uh, we will make this as painless as possible for you. And to work with Zelensky, um, and this was the important thing that came out of these second negotiations, um, to increase the humanitarian relief available to Ukrainians caught up in the, in the fight. And fortunately, it seems as if the Zelensky government has agreed uh, to that, but there is no negotiation here. Uh, those, those pathetic little characters who come to the table aren't equals. They aren't equals in any sense of the way. The Russians are treating them with respect, but these are not equal parties. Uh, when they speak, Russia's not listening. Um, when Russia speaks, they had better be listening because that's the the reality is unfolding on the ground as we speak. Uh, that is the reality. And you see this with an increasingly unhinged Zelensky. When you look at his pathetic performance before the camera yesterday, that was the performance of a man who knows the end is near. He knows the truth. He knows his troops can't communicate. He knows that his command and control is fractured. He knows that his brigades are being surrounded and annihilated in the east as we speak. He knows all of this. So he's he's unhinged, totally unhinged. Uh, whereas Putin, on the other hand, sits there calmly and gives you the facts. And there's no yielding in Putin. You don't see in Putin any of the uh, Emmanuel Macron hand-wringing or the pathetic 
table pounding of a Boris Johnson or the shouting into the television screen of a Joe Biden. The West is unhinged. The West is totally unhinged, whereas the Russians are just business as usual. Well, let me ask you now about the the issue of whether there can be an insurgency. As you said, Zelensky, is, you think he's defeated. His only hope is that NATO in some way comes to his defense, not directly by intervening, although he'd probably want that, but by supplying fighters and material to bog down and bleed Russia for years in a insurgency in the West, where the center of neo-Nazism is, as you said. Is that the way you see it? There will not be an insurgency of any meaningful character. I'll tell you why. First of all, um, with all due respect to the current people who live in the world today, they're wimps. Um, we don't have hard people anymore, not in the West. We have soft people. Uh, we don't have people that like to die. We have people who like to live. And that's a good thing. Living is good. But it, um, it creates a... Uh, a desire to uh, not sacrifice yourself in a, a futile cause. Um, European cities used to be leveled as a matter of course uh, and the world didn't end. Now one, uh, and I'll tell you this, as somebody who actually participated in the strategic planning of a strategic air campaign against the nation, which I did during the Gulf War against Iraq, um, I will tell you that uh, any concept of uh, the you know, leveling war crimes charges against the, the Russians is, is absurd. Um, the Russians have taken a very uh, measured approach to targeting, and I can guarantee you every single strike they make, they have the intelligence uh, write-up available to say why they did it. Um, and if this ever went to trial, which it won't, they'll just be able to answer by saying we had a military necessity based upon the fact that those idiots put this piece of equipment here or those idiots are broadcasting out of here and they willfully uh, put the civilian population at risk. Uh, we went in and told the civilians to leave. Uh, anybody who stayed behind um, is collateral damage. Um, and, and the reason why I bring that up is there isn't going to be, again, everything we see on TV now is an information operation from the Ukrainians. I mean, I'm tired of seeing 23-year-old girls tell me how willing they are to sacrifice their lives in the cause of, uh, you know, great Ukraine. If you're so god, excuse me, if you're so willing to sacrifice your life, stop talking on TV. Go to the front line and die already, um, it, because they're not willing to sacrifice their life. They're willing to make a political statement to a camera, but when it actually comes time to do the deed, it's one thing to make a Molotov cocktail. It's another thing to actually pucker up and say, I'm going to go out in the street and I'm going to expose myself to throw this, knowing that the last person who did it had their body shredded by 30 millimeter automatic weapon fire. I mean, that's the reality of war. And it's hitting home to these people. They're seeing what's happening when you stand up to the Russian military. You die. and You don't die pretty. It's not a Hollywood movie. Oh, and I get to make a speech before I go. Your body is gone, man. There ain't nothing to put in the ground. There won't even be a closed casket. So it's so this is the reality of war. So the concept of the Ukrainian people today, these westernized punks, are going to somehow sacrifice themselves for what? Zelensky may have already fled. According to the head of the Russian Duma, he's gone. Um, what are they fighting for? Now, we talk about an insurgency. The CIA has been training Western Ukrainians and Eastern Ukrainians in what's called unconventional warfare operations since 2015 under the Obama administration. One thing I can tell you about the CIA operating in Ukraine and Russia is they are the sloppiest people the world has ever seen. They suck at operational security. The fact that we know about this proves that they suck at operational security. Okay, uh, so you know if we didn't know about it, if we we're wondering, is the CIA doing this? They might have a fighting chance. But the fact that this has been broadcast and the CIA has admitted its own failing, saying that they don't know if the guys they brought from Ukraine to the United States to receive this training are loyal or not. What they do know is that a number of the guys who went back died because they were identified and eliminated. The Russians are controlling the CIA operation the same way that the Iraqis controlled the CIA covert activity in 1996 to topple Saddam Hussein. CIA ran this massive program. 
had hundreds of Iraqis recruited, ready to rise up and kill Saddam. And then at the magic moment, the Iraqis who had infiltrated it, identified everybody, killed everybody, got on the phone and thanked the CIA for the provision of outstanding communications equipment. That's what the Russians are going to do to this pathetic little CIA operation. They've already rolled it up. It doesn't exist. And whatever exists is, is designed for the Russians to track who's coming in. These mercenaries, you want to know what their fate is? Go back and take a look at the fate of mercenaries who went into Angola in the 1970s. Pathetic little tough guy wannabes who dressed up like soldier and got captured by the Cubans and the Angolans and executed. That is their fate. The Russian generals have already said so. The best thing that's going to happen to you, they said, is that you will be treated as a criminal. That's the best thing that's going to happen to you. The worst thing that's going to happen to you is what should happen to them. I capture you, I line you up against the wall, and I shoot you immediately with a little summary thing saying, are you an American? Yes. Um, you're here to fight against Russia? Yeah. Pull the trigger, boom, dead. That's what the law of war allows. And that's what will happen to them. There won't be an insurgency. Yes, people will say one or two people popped off, fired one of their javelins or their in-laws, or they threw a grenade in and all that stuff. That's not an insurgency. The last time there was an insurgency in Western Ukraine was from 1945 to 1953, 55, approximately. CIA-backed German-organized uh, um, uh, group. Um, 250,000 Ukrainians died. 23,000 Russian security forces died. That's how Russia handles insurgencies. This isn't Afghanistan. This is Ukraine. So I don't think there's going to be insurgency. I think the Russians have prepared for this. I, I don't think the Ukrainians have the will to fight. I think Ukraine will, uh, you'll see that all these heroes in Lvov will flee to Poland. Um, and they might be fleeing now. Uh, they don't want to die. Nobody wants to die. These aren't heroes. These are not heroic people. They're thugs. The Azov Battalion are thugs. They're, they're killers. They're rapists, uh, but they're not heroic fighters. So, so uh, Scott, what kind of time frame do you see Russia pacifying the entire country all the way to the Polish border, as you said? And will it require urban warfare? We're already hearing stories of urban warfare, street battles. Well, it's not real urban warfare. Real urban warfare, it'd be over by now. You know, the Russians have... <laughs> one of the things I've learned by studying the Russians is they're very clever. Um, they, they actually have created a unit recognizing the reality of uh, warfare in Europe today. Uh, it's the Assault Engineer Regiment. And the Assault Engineer Regiment's sole job is to pound a path through an urban area so that mechanized forces can rapidly pass through. Uh, when I say pound a path, I mean pound a path. They're, they will destroy everything in their path. Boom, 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 boom. They chew up a battalion. That battalion's replaced. The next battalion comes in. They sacrifice the regiment to basically put a, 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 a path through the city. That's not happening right now. So there's no real urban warfare. If I think the Russians don't want to go into Kiev. I would be surprised if there was a battle for Kiev. I think the Russians will surround Kiev. I think Russians will give Kiev the Syria treatment and say, good luck eating. We control all your electricity. We control your water. When your guys are tired of being cold, hungry, and, 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 and everything thirsty, uh, come to us and we will solve this, this issue. Uh, I think the Russians have already identified the government that's going to take the place of uh, Zelensky, um, and they're going to leave much of the issue of governing to this government. Um, this isn't going to be an occupation in the traditional sense. This is going to be the annihilation, eradication of the uh, nationalists in Western Ukraine, um, and then Russia will secure the border and turn the rest of it over to the internal police of the new Ukrainian state, uh, who are equipped with all the names of everybody who's ever said anything. But, you know, all these idiots out there with their, you know, this right here is a suicide pill. If you're, a, if you're an idiot insurgent or a nationalist, every time you get on your little phone and do something, the Russians are sucking it up. They got all your data. They know who you are. They've geolocated you. And when the time comes, they will hunt you down and kill you. That's why there won't be an insurgency. The CIA could have, if they'd done it truly covertly, probably left some stay behind units that would have been isolated and killed. But right now, no, this is, again, part of the propaganda that's coming out. Insurgencies are very difficult to organize, very difficult to sustain. Um, they tend to die violently. 
And I will tell you right now, anybody who thinks you're going to be a brave Western Ukrainian insurgent, um, better have picked the grave plot already, had it dug and put some fake body in there because your body will never reach it. Your body will be scattered all over the force of Western Ukraine. So you think this be, could be over in a month? Yes. In a month? In a month. month. Look, they, I think that the, that the defeat of the Ukrainian military is happening as we speak. Um, you know, military defeats are deceptive in nature. To give you an example, the defeat of uh, Army Group Center uh, in, 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 in Russia, uh, German Army Group Center in Russia in 1944. You had German units fighting on the front line, grinding the Russians down, grinding them down, grinding them down, grinding them down. And suddenly there wasn't anything left. And the German unit cohesiveness broke and the Russians poured through. Um, the grinding down has already occurred. We're on the cusp of the pouring through stage. And um, it'll be slower than normal because the Russians are not interested in a war of annihilation. They would prefer to process Ukrainian prisoners rather than kill Ukrainian soldiers. So there will be a little bit of a, uh, there will be a self-regulated pace put in here to give the Ukrainians a chance to surrender. Um, but the, the war's over already, it's finished. It's, Are you they, surprised they, by the degree of the of the resistance that the Ukrainians have put up so far? Well, I think, first of all, the degree of resistance has been highly exaggerated. The Russians have admitted, several generals have admitted that they put, that two things happened. One, the soft approach of going in and trying to negotiate um, opened them up to being killed. Uh, we saw in Kharkiv uh, one of the Spetsnaz units that went in to negotiate was isolated and destroyed by the Ukrainians who operated in bad faith. Uh, the Russians have also said that they've had a couple, um, you know, um, who is that girl, Lynch, uh, Jessica Lynch, remember uh, Gulf War? Her, they've had a couple Jessica Lynch moments. What that means is uh, the seventh transportation company equivalent of the Russians um, went out for a drive uh, thinking, we're just driving to link up with the next unit, maybe took a wrong turn, maybe got ahead of themselves, and found themselves in Ukrainian territory where they were annihilated. Um, you know, so these these things have happened, but you haven't seen the you know the defeat of the Russian military on the battlefield. No one's come in and shown me. Um, I've seen columns destroyed, but no one's shown me the Russian tanks littering the battlefield with Russian bodies all over the place. I have seen that of the Ukrainian army. Um, I've seen where they stood up and fought, and they've been totally obliterated. Um, so, you know, when you say resistance, you know, I'm not, again, denigrating the courage of those Ukrainians who have fought. They have true resistance. You require absolute command and control and unit cohesiveness. And that's lacking right now on the Ukrainian side. Um, to, the, to the extent that they're, that they're fighting, it's only because the Russians have allowed them to live to fight. This pro the Russians could solve almost every single military problem by pulling back and just pouring in the artillery that they have. That's normally how they solve a solution. So when you come up and you probe and you find a Ukrainian military position, pull back and annihilate it, obliterate it. And uh, they're not doing that because they don't want to go down in history as the guys who have alienated every single mother in Ukraine by killing their son. They want to give the Ukrainian men a chance to surrender and go home. Um, so that, you know, I, I think most of the Ukrainian resistance is either from the fanatic Azov units uh, in Mariupol and elsewhere, or because the Russians are allowing the Ukrainians to resist more than they should allow them in a normal combat situation. Uh, Mar so, in Italy. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they don't exist in uh, Chechnya, I'll tell you that. Um, I, I, I Look, I'm not... <laughs> I'll say a couple of things just in defense of myself. One, I've never said that I'm anti-war. I've always said that I'm uh, pro-diplomacy. Um, but I don't want to come off as too bloodthirsty. But there's a time and a place for killing. And um, I, I believe that uh, fight, when the Russians were fighting the, uh, the, the, the Chechen uh, extremists, um, they needed to die. I think when, the United, when anybody's fighting a jihadist in Syria, they need to die. I will not shed tears for them. Al-Qaeda? slaughter them like dogs. And these Nazis in Western Ukraine, I don't care about them. Um, and neither does Russia. And, um, you know, I, I also believe when you have a hate-filled ideology like that, 
The only solution is the is is the extreme solution. A denazification means denazification. Um, there's no half measure here. Uh, now they may not they may not have to destroy all of Lvov to do it. Um, they will surround Lvov. They will give the uh, the Nazis every chance to flee to Poland. Um, but there won't be any Nazis alive in uh, in in Western Ukraine when this is done. Just like there's you know Shamil Baisayev's uh, followers don't exist anymore. They've all gone to heaven. They're with the virgins, man, uh, because the Russians took care of them. It was bloody. Um, it wasn't easy, but it was decisive. That's why you have 40,000 Chechen uh, fanatics marching in Ukraine today uh, in support of Vladimir Putin, because they won that insurgency, the Russians. And I, I am convinced that the Russians don't play, they, they, don't, they don't quit an operation halfway through. They don't play, you know, this isn't a kid's game in the playground. This is real. This is as real as it gets. And uh, they made the decision to invade Ukraine, which is the ultimate decision, one which I wish they had made a different decision. You know, I, I wish they had found a given, allowed this thing to play out even more, but you knew they weren't. When they met with China on February 4th and entered that 5,000 word agreement, which basically was a declaration of war against the unipolar system, um, they made the decision that they were divorcing themselves from the West. That's why I laugh when you, I don't mean to be mean to the, to the business class in Moscow, but they're self-purging. Um, you know, one of the big difficulties Russia's always had in terms of engaging effectively with China is this pro-Western business class. These Western intelligentsia who are married to the idea of Russia being connected to the West. Well, thank you, Joe Biden. That's what that's what Vladimir Putin's saying right now. You just made this divorce the easiest divorce in the history of divorces because they can't blame me. You did it. You ended this. And there will be no going back. And that's why I think the pain will be less than some people project, because the pain that people are projecting is built premised on the notion that we're going that Russia is going to reconstruct its connectivity with the West. No, that's over. Russia yeah, is yeah. compelled to go east, and China and India, look, they talked about the Trans-Eurasian Economic Partnership. This is a real deal. It's not fake. There's more people in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization than exist in the European Union and NATO combined. Uh, their economies have more economic growth potential than, than the West. And when Russia finally pulls the trigger on its counter sanctions plan, which it hasn't done yet, um, the pain will be, I just went and bought gas today, just a little anecdotal story. Um, $4.19, I went in to pay, and the guy said, <laughs> you're damn lucky you came right now because we actually are right in the process of reconfiguring our pumps to $4.39 a gallon. And he said, you know, and that price is probably gonna go up to uh, $4.50 by uh, tomorrow, and Russia hasn't done anything yet. When Russia finally counterattacks on the economic front, it will be surgical, it will be decisive, and it will be painful. And um, you know, so the West is gonna be screaming louder than any Russian, I believe, will be screaming pretty soon. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I, look, Mark, I'm not in Moscow, so I apologize if I'm coming off a little callous. You know, I got relatives in Moscow, I've got, I've got bleeding heart liberal relatives in Moscow um, who are as anti-Putin as they get. And they are angry. They are sad. They are upset. They are scared. Um, and I, I, under no circumstances am I trying to be unsympathetic uh, to, to, to their plight, because it is a real plight. Um, and if I ever put on my hu human hat. Plight. I'm not sympathetic to their plight. I live here. <laughs> <laughs> But if I put on my human hat, you know, I, I will come off a little bit softer than I am right now. But I got my geopolitical hat on right now, and I'm just talking about hardcore reality. And the hardcore reality is the West has committed suicide um, in the name of going after Vladimir Putin. Uh, and Vladimir Putin's not going, in, going away anytime soon. And I think the Russia we're going to see emerging from this is a Russia that has decisively pivoted to the East and will never again pivot West. Not in our not in our lifetime.